So I want to spend a little more time talking about why I particularly am interested in digital marketing so you understand where I come from. And I'm going to use a little bit of this um, as an excuse to highlight some research and some insights uh, and provide some interesting questions that you might want to think about when it comes to digital marketing as we go forward with this course. So give you a little bit of background. I come out of a field known as complex systems. And complex systems is the idea that you can understand a lot of the most interesting problems in the world better by understanding individual entities involved in those problems and all the interactions between them. A lot of complex systems is characterized by things like emergent properties. The idea is that there is some property that emerges at a higher level that's not present at a lower level. Uh, for instance, market share is something that is a, an emergent property of a lot of different consumers making a decision, right? Not one consumer can't determine the market share of PS4s versus Xbox Ones, but a group of consumers acting together can make that decision, right? But no consumer has an idea of market share. In fact, many consumers might have two uh, particular platforms in their home, right? And another property that's often related is feedbacks and self-organization. So pressure from these higher levels, once they merge, feed back to affect the organization patterns of the lower levels, right? So as market share increases for a particular platform, um, say the Xbox One really starts to take hold, right? Then it becomes more and more probable that I am going to buy an Xbox One as opposed to a PS4 or something like that, right? Um, and this notion of emergent properties, feedback, self-organization can be applied to a large ranging number of fields and has from economics uh, to history to uh, computer science to to, uh, biology to business and management, right? Um, and I view internet marketing and digital marketing in many ways as an archetypical example of the complex system, right? Fundamentally, it's about how users use digital means to interact with companies, right, and organizations. Uh, but something like the virality of messaging, for instance, is an emergent property of consumer interactions. No one decides uh, that a particular video is going to go wild, like the bottle flip video uh, from a North Carolina high school student, right? That's not a particular decision of any one individual, though many individuals might want it. It's the, it's the act of a lot of people passing that message around, sending it on to others, that really makes it go viral. And what consumers fixate on, then creates a feedback that affects marketers' decision because the marketers now are driven by what pieces of content they see as being particularly popular and particularly useful. For instance, if a bunch of people start using Instagram, then can, marketers are going to switch to um, using Instagram more popularly. And in fact, they have to some extent. So that kind of gives you the lens by which I view the world. And now I'm going to go down and I'm going to dive into a couple of different interesting areas of digital marketing to kind of whet your appetite for some of the problems that we might be discussing in this course. So the first one I want to talk about a little bit is called, I just generically call influence, uh, but it's about the idea of how in individuals might have more influence than other individuals within the digital marketing context. And this is one of the first papers I published about digital marketing, uh, and it's actually more published on the computer science side, more interested on the computer science side, with uh, colleagues Forrest Stonedahl and Uri Walensky. Let's imagine a game, we'll call it the influence game, right? Imagine you have the ability to convince a limited number of people to adopt an idea, buy a product, or go to an event. Maybe you could, for instance, get them all to watch a video, or you could give them a free product, or you could give them tickets to the event. Um, and you think that as a result of doing that, they'll have a positive experience, and they'll want to spread the idea about that uh, or product or event to other people, right? Um, and this is essentially what's known sometimes as influencer marketing, right? You kind of try and identify influencers, give them some good product, get them to talk positively about it, right? So the problem with this is you have a limited budget, right? You don't have infinite money. You can't give, you can't give away all the product, right? Because then you won't make any money off selling the product. Um, and, you know, this could be time, money, or some other kind of material constraint. So then the question becomes, who and how many people should you seed uh, which is the word we're using to give this product to them, to maximize both the reach and the speed of the diffusion of that product or idea through the entire population, right? So let's take it back a little bit, right? We're just asking, I know there's this market, I can give away some samples maybe, for instance. Um, I think that'll cause positive effects within the market. How do I identify which people to give those samples to and how many people should I give the samples to, right? Um, so who should you see it is an interesting question, right? 
Uh, which individuals that you see it are going to allow you to reach the widest audience as soon as possible? The standard rule of thumb in influencer marketing has often been to see those individuals with the highest number of connections, right? The, I, you know, so I, I often like to think about this. I'm from the Midwest originally. I grew up in Ohio and Michigan, right? And I like to think about this in terms of high schools, right? If you were at a high school and you were going to see the person who had the most friends in the high school, a lot of times in the Midwest, it's all about football. It's the quarterback or the captain of the football team, right? So you go to that guy, you're, usually it is a guy, uh, you give them a Xbox or a PS4, and you say, here's, here's the, the, the product, I want you to play around with it, and just you know invite your friends over, play with it, talk to them about it, see what's going on. The idea that maybe that will cause positive things to spill over to the rest of the community, right? That's the normal approach, right? But you could think about other approaches, right? Maybe you could find people whose friends don't talk to each other, right? So, for instance, let's imagine uh, that the kicker on the football team is also the uh, first chair violin in the, uh, in the school orchestra, right? They have a very disparate set of friends. They don't know each other as well, right? The orchestra people are different. Maybe that'll cause things to spread quicker, right? Because of the fact that you have this, that the, the, they're not talking to all the same people all the time. You could also imagine, and we call that, by the way, a technical term for that is that that person has a low clustering coefficient. The clusters of individual around them aren't uh, very tight. And so as a result, they have a low clustering coefficient. You could also imagine that there's a person who might not have a lot of friends, but whose friends know a lot of people and whose friends know a lot of people and so forth, such that they wind up being at kind of like the middle of the overall network. I mean, we refer to this as the average path like an individual. In other words, the number of steps you need to take, a number of friendships you need to look at to go from that individual to anyone else, and the network is fairly low, right? So imagine, for instance, the, the student librarian just happens to have two friends here, two friends there, such that they know everyone in the school in like three hops, right? Where someone else might take a lot more, right? So we're gonna think about those different strategies, right? But you can also think about questions like how many people are you gonna see, right? So seeding more people means the message spreads quicker, but seeding more people also costs you more money, right? It costs you uh, uh, money to see those people. And at a certain point, you are going to be seeding people who would have adopted anyway because of their friends. So how many people should you seed in this social network? So in our experiment, in our, what we did was we built a model of information diffusion about how people would talk about this, right? We then looked at a variety of different networks, a random network, which is just literally we connect people up randomly, a lattice network where people know the people next to them on a neighborhood. You can imagine this to be something like a literal physical neighborhood, right, where I know Bob across the street, Alice who lives next door to me, and Sam who lives on the other side of me, right? A small world network, and you may have heard this term before, uh, this is actually a technical small world network in this case where we start with a lattice network, but we give a couple of people some long distance connections. Uh, and that tends to resemble real world social networks in many ways. Uh, and something called a preferential attachment network. And this is the idea that somebody who has a lot of friends is more likely to get one new friend than someone who has very few friends. And so you get this like very skewed distribution of friendship in this network. And finally, we looked at a Twitter network as well. And to some extent, these other synthetic networks aren't as interesting. It turns out in all those networks, actually the best strategy is to find the person who has the most friends, and which is ironic in some ways because in the lattice network, for instance, everyone has the same number of friends, but it doesn't matter. There is no better strategy in those spaces. What we did find, though, uh, was that the budgets changed between each of these networks. And so, for instance, when you're seeding something like um, the lattice and the random network where everyone looks very similar to each other, you need to see it a lot of individuals because there's no way to cause the message to spread quickly. As you have individuals in your network who have more and more friends, you can see fewer and fewer individuals. And so, for instance, uh, the, um, the random network has more of a distribution of friendship, and so that results in you getting, uh, being able to see fewer individuals. And the preferential attachment network seeds more, uh, has more of a distribution, and there's some individuals who are very powerful in that network, so you don't have to see nearly as high. Interesting enough, the Twitter network um, seem to have the highest uh, number, this, this uh, skewness in terms of people with lots of friends. 
Um, and so as a result, that was where you need to seed the people the least, uh, the, the seed the least number of individuals to get the maximum diffusion throughout the network, right? Um, just to explain this graph, right, the x-axis is pretty obvious, it's the seeding fraction. The y-axis is what's known as the Gini coefficient. And the Gini coefficient actually me measures how unequal the friendship networks are, right? So the random and, uh, sorry, the lattice and the um, uh, small world network have very similar looking networks, whereas the uh, random network has a slightly unequal network. Some people have more friends than others. And preferential tapment has a very unequal network, and the Twitter had the most unequal network of all of them. So that answers how uh, when uh, how many people to seed, but who should you seed, right? And as I mentioned previously, for the synthetic networks, uh, the ones that weren't Twitter, we found that in fact seeding the person with the most friends made the most sense. However, in the case of the Twitter network, we actually found a different result. We found that you should seed individuals who have lots of friends, but who have this low clustering coefficient. In other words, their friends don't know each other, right? Um, in fact, to explain that a little bit better, let me take a look at this. So this is actually the Twitter network that we're looking at right here. And as you can see, when we see just the people with the most friends, we see the very middle of this network, right? And if we see the people just with low clustering coefficient, we wind up seeding the very outside of the network, which is also not very useful. However, if we see um, the individuals who have a mix, of the clustering coefficient and the degree, right, the pure degree, the high degree, we get this group of individuals, some of whom are concentrated in the middle, but others who are what we might call boundary scanners. These are individuals who sit between large nodes within the network, right? This actually guarantees the fastest diffusion throughout the entire network of any of the strategies that we looked at. We looked at all possible combinations of these strategies within this space. However, there is an argument that seeding is not the only strategy you should really rely upon. This was made by Sinan Aral in 2013 in an HBR article. Um, he, made, he says influence strategies are great, but you have to worry about confusing contagion with homophily. Um, a lot of times, right, when you look at the results of an influence strategy, what you're really looking at is the fact that you're seeding people who are friends with people who are very similar to them. So they're not actually convincing those people, um, but they just have similar properties, and so they're gonna adopt anyways, right? Um, if you take it back to the football scenario that we talked about, right? I give the PlayStation 4 to the quarterback because I think he's gonna tell a lot of friends and they're gonna buy it because he bought it. In reality, a lot of those people have very similar properties to that quarterback. They're gonna like the same things, right? Because that, otherwise they would be friends with him. And so as a result, they might have bought it even if he had never said anything about it, right? So that's the idea that maybe in a lot of these cases, the influence um, strategies actually don't work very often, especially because early adopters tend to be very similar to each other. As a result, the role of influence in that space is often exaggerated. Um, so, you know, just to wrap this up a little, people with lots of friends know other people with lots of friends, which often constrains social contagion. The most influential people have lots of friends, but those friends don't know each other, right? Because that allows them to spread the interesting messages to different groups of individuals simultaneously. But all of this work, all of what I've said so far, assumes that all individuals trust each other equally. Trust is going to play a big role in digital marketing. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that in the next video.